the title of my talk today, as you see, is uh, Mechanical Breath Magic, Taking Off the Socks Without Removing the Shoes. And uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, well, basically, look at the problem we have with, a, uh, with uh, ARDS. We have this heterogeneously ventilated lung. We have uh, edema. We have loss of surfactant. We have normal lung. We have to push one breath into that patient's lung to try to oxygenate and ventilate that patient and not injure the lung further with a ventilator. That's a pretty tough trick. It's almost like a magic trick. Uh, it'd be almost like trying to take someone's shoes off or socks off without removing the shoes. And uh, before we get started, I also have to go through disclosures. And since I've been in the business for 40 years, I actually have quite a few. And as Mickey said, uh, none of our work is influenced by any uh, or corporate um, uh, in, in, uh, 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 people, persons, companies. Uh, we're uh, essentially uh, NIH and uh, privately funded for all of our experiments. I'm a consultant for Entrexon. I have an uh, NIH grant. I have a DOD grant. Uh, I have travel and honorarium from Draeger. Uh, I've established, uh, uh, my group and I have established an APRV network. We conduct APRV workshops, and I have five patents on various ventilatory and, uh, and other strategies to protect the lung. So with that over, uh, now what's the magic trick? And because uh, hopefully I'm a better scientist than I am a magician, I'm actually going to tell you what the trick is and it's science. Uh, what we have to do is understand the physiology of ARDS. We have to understand how the lung gets sick and what the problems are in order to understand uh, how the ventilator can either protect or, the, or injure the lung with these changes in physiologic state. So science is the key uh, to moving uh, forward. So how do we trick the lung into oxygenating and ventilating and still not injure it with the ventilator? What is the trick? Well, first we have to understand the science of uh, the pathophysiology of acute respiratory stress syndrome. We have to thoroughly know the disease before we can treat it. Next, we have to uh, combine this understanding uh, with the science of ventilation-induced lung injury. And a lot of this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to go over it. Uh, what Mickey talked about was the stress and the strain. The stress being put into the lung, which is a tidal volume, and the strain on the lung, the change in the size and the number of alveoli. Uh, we're all very interested and very excited about uh, clinical trials. Uh, they're very important to our business, uh, but they're not the only science out there. Uh, phase three clinical trials really are the gold standard, and, and we all agree with that, but they are statistical exercises. They don't show cause and effect. Uh, they'll just show that one patient population is statistically has a statistically less mortality than the others. Uh, and we are in a physiology. We really want to find out cause and effect. We want to find what um, uh, changes in the ventilator cause what effect in the, uh, in the physiology. And I really like this quote by Dr. Gattinoni uh, saying that physiology is the basis of medical reasoning, not statistics. We really have to understand the science. Statistics are simply a tool. So just remember that the, the physiology uh, is a very important uh, additional work to uh, phase three clinical trials. So our goals for today, uh, again, we're going to review the science. That's uh, sort of our strong point. We're going to look at the pathophysiology of ARDS. And then maybe importantly, what is unique about ARDS pathophysiology that, that uh, sets up the lung for the secondary ventilator-induced lung injury? There's something about ARDS that really sets the lung up for a secondary injury. And once we understand the, uh, these uh, pathophysiologies, then we can uh, move on to how we're going to design a optimal mechanical breath with now our understanding of pulmonary physiology to, to reduce uh, ventilator-induced lung injury and hopefully mortality associated with ARDS. So we're going to start with the pathophysiology of ARDS. And I just want to uh, uh, briefly show the, uh, uh, the change in alveolar mechanics, which Mickey did a very good job in talking about. And here we have a normal uh, rat lung. You can see the, the apical lobe and the diaphragmatic lobe. Uh, and you can see it's being ventilated, but you can see the alveoli move very, uh, a very small movement in alveoli in the two dimensions we can see with our microscope in the normal lung. That's due to the interdependence, the shared alveolar walls. This is a nice, healthy lung, very resistant to overdistension uh, or collapse and expansion. Uh, compare this to the ARDS uh, rat lung. Uh, this is an alveolar duct. You can see alveoli are all collapsed around it. And this alveolus here collapses and opens with every breath, and you can see in this lobe the same thing. A totally different alveolar mechanics with the development of ARDS. Now, rather than homogeneous and stable, they are heterogeneous and collapsing and expanding. 
I just want to briefly talk about what we consider the, the pathologic tetrad of ARDS. And these are all very, very well-known pathologies, but we chose these for one specific reason, because these four pathologies are what make your patients sick. So in a translational lab like ours, uh, we have to focus on the, the diseases, the, the, the components of the disease that actually make the patient sick, and then we have to try to treat these. Uh, the first is increased capillary permeability. Both in primary and secondary ARDS, yes, uh, the capillaries in the lung become leaky, and they, tend, and they will eventually cause alveolar flooding with edema fluid. Uh, alveolar flooding will lead to surfactant deactivation. As you all know, surfactant is necessary to keep op alveoli open and stable. Uh, if uh, surfactant deactivation is significant enough, alveoli will become unstable, as I just showed you. And this secondary alveolar collapse and expansion, that's what's going to call, lead to uh, one, or one of the main mechanisms of ventilator-induced lung injury. So this is the tetrad. We have, to uh, we have to use our mechanical ventilator in order to try to block uh, some or all of these. And we really felt uh, quite a few years ago that with proper understanding of uh, alveolar mechanics, uh, how the alveoli chain size and shape with ventilation that we could adjust the mechanical breath to block some or all of these components. So our hypothesis was that a properly adjusted mechanical ventilation can block all of the, the major uh, tetrad of ARDS. So with that is our basic uh, ARDS pathophysiology, those, those four basic uh, components of ARDS. Now why do those four components make the lung so vulnerable to ventilator-induced lung injury? Uh, so. Uh, it really, it's, it's, we think it's fairly simple. Uh, we think the lung changes uh, physiology from a, a homogeneous ventilated lung, where all of the alveoli open are stable, to a heterogeneous, unstable lung. Now we have collapse and opening, and uh, as you saw from Mickey's data, you have a heterogeneous lung with big alveoli and small alveoli, uh, and a large change in the alveolar tidal volume. So well, our goal with the mechanical ventilator is to keep the lung homogeneous. Once it goes to heterogeneous, then we've got problems. Uh, and again, just quickly, this would be a homogeneously ventilated lung. This was one of those 48-hour uh, pig models where we kept the lung uh, open and stable for the entire uh, uh, 48 hours. And this was uh, when uh, the ventilation strategy allowed the uh, lung to become heterogeneous, and we had full-blown ARDS in the 48-hour uh, study. So what are the problems caused by heterogeneous, unstable ventilation really? So this is just like a quick sort of cartoon to show you what, what the real, what, what the two basic problems are. If we have a high mechanical stress with our mechanical ventilator and it causes excessive strain, a big change in alveolar size, then we, that can lead to a stress failure and severe injury. So it's really an excessive stress uh, or stress causing excessive strain or size change that can lead to a failure of the lung. So the mechanisms of villi uh, at the alveolar level, uh, there's uh, First off is this dynamic alveolar strain. Alveoli opening and collapsing with each breath uh, can cause a shear stress on the alveolar walls and cellular damage leading to uh, edema. And uh, this sets up again by which of the tetrads are causing this problem. It's really the edema and surfactant deactivation that lead to that alveolar instability. Second are stress concentrators, which uh, Mickey went over very nicely. This is where you have uh, some areas of lung that are collapsed and not moving, and other uh, areas of lung surrounding that uh, uh, collapsed tissue that are fully inflated. And again, the collapsed tissue is caused by edema and surfactant deactivation. And lastly, we have overdistension. And uh, again, as Mickey presented, uh, the overdistension really occurs uh, only after the development of this recruitment, derecruitment, and stress concentration. Once you have a heterogeneous uh, lung, then the alveoli can overexpand and cause a uh, and cause injury. So first, let's look at uh, this dynamic alveolar strain. And again, this shows a normal uh, rat lung, uh, very little change in the alveolar size. You can see it's homogeneously ventilated. All of the alveoli are full. Um, and we modeled this uh, based on the uh, model of Jerry Mead, 1970. Uh, this, these are our uh, uh, alveoli, the hexagons. Notice the key thing about the structure, uh, the microstructure of the lung, is all of those alveoli share walls. They're not individual grapes, they're interconnected. The term that Dr. Mead used was interdependence, and that really protects the alveoli from collapsing and expanding, because this guy here can't collapse because his neighbors are going to hold him up, or overexpanding for the same reason. The alveoli can't overexpand because the neighbors have the same pressure, and therefore there's no place to go. 
So uh, this is the model that we use to study uh, these dynamic alveolar mechanics. And our observation showed that in a normal uh, lung with a standard, uh, low, uh, standard tidal uh, ventilation, uh, 10 and 5 of PEEP, that we only have about a 2% change in the, in the area that we see. Now contrast this to what happens in the heterogeneous lung. Now what we have right in the center, this is a whole group of alveoli that have lost surfactant function, and now they collapse and expand with each breath. Uh, so Dr. Amato used to use the term, uh, it's, like in, it's like breaking a paper clip. So if you take these alveoli and collapse them and expand them each, each, each breath, it's like taking a paper clip, bending it back and forth a dozen times, the paper clip's going to break. So the alveoli in the center here are going to break due to the shear stress, to this dynamic strain. But notice the alveoli that are connected to it, how they overdistend with each breath. So not only are the alveoli in the, uh, in, that are unstable and collapsed and expanding going to be injured, also are the neighboring alveoli are going to be uh, stressed and strained and uh, cause the injury to that uh, part of the lung also. And I really want to get this point across, so I'm going to show it one more, uh, one more example. Uh, now we have a very simplified lung. Here we have a, uh, uh, the, the, the big circle is the uh, lung, the four small circles are the alveoli. And as you can see, because it's homogeneously inflated, the, uh, the alveoli can't overexpand or they can't collapse. What happens if we collapse one alveolus? Now we've gone from homogeneous to heterogeneous. Now you can see the great deal of dynamic strain that can occur as these alveoli, uh, uh, they no longer have the pressure in this alveolus to uh, work against them, and now there's a pressure gradient in this area, and these alveoli uh, will cause excessive dynamic strain. And I always like to show biological evidence of our hypotheses, and in this case, this was a pig lung with ARDS. You can see homogeneous ventilation everywhere but in the lower left corner. And that's the only place where this alveolus is bulging into that area. So the one area in this, this uh, video micrograph that uh, is causing a ventilator-induced lung injury to this alveolus is where there's heterogeneity, where there's a collapsed alveolus. Now let's switch to stress concentration. And again, uh, Mickey did a really good job at this. Uh, I'm just going to show it from a little bit different perspective. And uh, when I was first trying, studying this, uh, I didn't have a good comprehension of what stress concentration was. And uh, so I Googled it. And uh, these are the kind of, um, um, of photos of, of th that come up with a Google uh, in the, in the uh, engineering section. And this is just a board. And these lines represent stress. So you can see in this board without any defects, the stress lines go through the board nice and evenly. But notice what happens with uh, if you put a round hole, a square hole, or a wedge into this board. Uh, notice how the stress lines get closer together. As it, wherever the stress lines are closer together, that's where there's more force, and that's where the break is going to occur. So you can see in the circle, it's there. In the square, it's there. But look at how the forces are, are concentrated when you have a wedge in the board. And that is where the uh, board's going to break. So that's what a stress concentration is. It's a non-uniform location in any kind of object. In our case, we're studying the lung that focuses stress uh, in a certain area that will cause damage in that area. So here we have our homogeneously ventilated lung. All of the hexagon alveoli are open. And we have nice, straight, evenly distributed stress across those uh, alveoli. Contrast this to heterogeneous. You can see that we have uh, uh, a, a alveoli collapsed in the center of the, uh, of, of the uh, photo here. And notice how the stress lines are compressed with the blue arrows into that area uh, of collapse. Uh, so you can see the stress is distributed across the lung differently uh, in, uh, from uh, homogeneous to heterogeneous ventilation. And here's an animation of a stress concentrator. Again, here we have the, uh, uh, the collapsed alveoli in the center. And here's inspiration and expiration. And you can see the overdistension uh, and the stress concentration in the alveoli adjacent to those collapsed alveoli. Now let's uh, quickly go into overdistension, because remember, overdistension, is, uh, we believe, only occurs secondary to alveolar recruitment, derecruitment, uh, and stress concentration. And again, I think the best representation of overdistension is once we have a heterogeneous uh, lung, we have uh, some alveoli collapse, then the adjacent alveoli can overdistend into those areas. And remember, right here, we have overdistension and uh, uh, next to the collapsing alveoli, and here we have overdistension next to the collapsed alveoli that are no longer being ventilated. Uh, so, uh, so really, I think if we can prevent uh, alveolar collapse and, and uh, recruitment, derecruitment, and we can prevent stress concentration, I think overdistension disappears. 
So what do we have to do with the mechanical breath uh, to try to solve these problems? Uh, I think it's pretty simple. We have to maintain homogeneous alveolar ventilation. Once we do that, uh, we open the lung and prevent, uh, prevent stress concentrators. And we have to prevent alveolar collapse and uh, expansion. We have to keep the lung open. So open the lung and keep it open, uh, preventing stress concentrations and dynamic strain. And guess what? Uh, we're not the first ones to say that. Way back in 1992, Dr. Burkhard Lachman uh, had a famous paper and a quote just saying, open the lung and keep it open. And all of our physiologic work for the last few years tends to support uh, Dr. Lachman's hypothesis that was actually generated in 1992. Uh, so we're starting to uh, uh, give a lot of very solid physiologic evidence uh, that indeed, if we open the lung and keep it open, that it's going to uh, be greatly protective. So now we have this crash course in, um, uh, in the physiology of ARDS and why that physiology causes uh, so many problems uh, with ventilator-induced lung injury. We have to start thinking about, okay, we have a problem here. We, we, sort of, we know what it is uh, for the most part. How are we going to adjust the mechanical ventilator in order to solve this problem? So what's the current thinking? The current thinking is to solve this problem is, to, is use recruitment maneuvers to open the lung. That makes sense. Uh, we're going to use PEEP to keep the lung open, and we're going to reduce tidal volume and uh, plateau pressure in order to mis minimize overdistension in the presence of that dynamic strain and uh, stress concentration. And that sounds really good. I mean, that's, that all makes perfect sense. Um, the problem is we've used these four components, tidal volume, plateau pressure, PEEP, and recruit maneuvers for quite a few years now, and we've used multiple combinations. We've tried really every trick in the book, uh, combining uh, with peeps and, and tidal volumes and recruit maneuvers and plateau pressures. And the problem is, as uh, Mickey showed in her data also, is that uh, in the last 15 years, we haven't reduced mortality uh, lower than that 40% or in the high 30s. We've done a nice job of bringing it from 70% down to 40, but we seem to be stuck. Uh, we can't get off that 40% or high 30% mortality. And uh, uh, a famous person, Dr. Albert Einstein, once said that insanity is doing the same thing over and, again, over and over again, expecting different results. So we've been using low tidal volume, peak plateau pressure for a number of years, and we're still stuck at 40. So we, we need to do something else. So first we have to analyze it. Let's, you know, again, we, uh, we work in a basic science lab, so we analyze problems all the time. So why haven't they worked? Let's, what's the basic science uh, meaning for why these haven't worked? Because they make sense. It seems like they should. Um, and we think it's because we don't understand dynamic alveolar physiology very well. And uh, so that's what we went, uh, we went out to solve. We have to understand uh, the dynamics, because the, the lung obviously is being ventilated. It's a very dynamic organ, organ. So we have to know the dynamics of how the alveoli inflate and the dynamics of how al the alveoli uh, collapse. And once we understand that, maybe it'll give us some new clues on how to uh, modify our ventilation. Uh, for the one thing we found out in, is that alveoli are not elastic in nature. They do not inflate and deflate linear in a linear fashion like a balloon, such that when you push one centimeter of pressure into your lung, your alveoli don't change uh, by, this, by order of magnitude in direct proportion with that breath. And likewise, the same on deflation. When you, uh, re when you let your tidal volume out during exhalation, alveoli do not respond in a one-to-one -one relationship as that tidal volume is lowered. Rather, we found that alveoli, uh, as in many biological tissues, is a viscoelastic system. And in a viscoelastic system, there's a time lag. And that's the thing I really want you to remember, time lag. So it's a, the duration, uh, the time that the breath is applied makes a huge difference in these dynamic alveolar mechanics. So there's a time lag from when the stress, in this case the tidal volume, is applied or removed, inhalation or exhalation, and when the alveolus begins to either recruit or chain size. And I'm going to use a, uh, a very classic um, way of, of, of teaching this viscoelasticity, uh, the spring and dash pot model. So we've brought this uh, old, uh, a very well-established model of the spring and dash pot, and now we're going to use that in order to, uh, uh, to try to analyze uh, dynamic alveolar physiology and see if that will help us in coming up with some new breath forms. So here's the spring and dash pot. We have a, again, this is the spring portion and it's connected to this dash pot, which is in a, uh, some type of viscous fluid. Um, the uh, dash pot will move more or less depending on the viscosity, viscosity uh, with the applied um, uh, stress due to the, uh, uh, to the spring. 
And we're going to, in this model, we're going to say the spring is the tidal volume. That's the stress applied. So you're pushing the tidal volume in and pulling it out. <clears throat> and we're going to say the dash pot is the strain, the number of alveoli that recruit. Uh, and again here, notice there's a time lag between the time the stress is applied or released and the initi initiation of the strain. In other words, it's not one to one. The, string, the spring is moving much greater than the dash pot. So that's the key thing. We have to remember this spring of dash pot, this viscoelasticity, this is how alveoli really work, or at least to the best of our knowledge. We surely don't think that we've solved all of the problems, but it's surely not an elastic bloom. It's not like a, it's much closer to this kind of physiology. So how do we use this knowledge? This, okay, they're, they're not elastic, they're viscoelastic. Well, you know, big deal, what am I gonna do about that? Um, so again, uh, new thinking. What was the old thinking just to start with? Recruit maneuver, peep, tidal volume. Recruit maneuver, reduce static uh, uh, stress concentrators by opening up the lung, peep, preventing collapse and expansion, and uh, t low tidal volume to minimize the overdistension of the baby lung. So the new thinking with the spring and dash pot. So, okay, if, if there's a time lag, if the duration of the breath plays a big role, uh, maybe a long inspiration time will help recruit the alveoli and reduce stress and concentrators. And maybe a very short expiration duration will actually reduce dynamic strain. So the new thinking is um, we, need to just, we need to think of how we can use the duration of the applied breath in order to trick these alveoli into uh, opening and staying, opening and staying open without causing excessive injury. So if you extend the duration inspiration, you, in theory, you're gonna continually recruit alveoli with each breath, reduce stress concentrations. And here's what it would look like in a spring of dash pot. Notice we stress the string and then we, the spring and then we hold it. The whole time we're holding that spring, uh, we're, we're applying that stress, we're seeing alveoli recruit. Okay, so the breath is in and the alveoli recruit, 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 recruit. Recruiting all during that applied stress. So what we wanna do is apply a extended uh, duration of stress in order to gradually pop these alveoli open. And again, going back to the biology, we always have biology to support our hypothesis. In this particular uh, uh, paper, Dr. Albert, who's also one of the by many brilliant students. Uh, he looked at a rat lung with ARDS. Uh, the red is atelectasis and the white is uh, open. You see how heterogeneously injured it is. And he applied a 40-40 recruitment maneuver, 40 centimeters of water for 40 seconds. And the key thing I want you guys to watch during this whole 40 seconds is pressure does not change. The only thing that's changing is time or duration of the applied breath. So notice in about two seconds, a lot of the alveoli pop open, going from red to pink. Now watch for the entire 40 seconds, you will see little areas of red going to pink uh, throughout the lung. Pressure is not changing. The only thing that's changing is the duration of the, the applied pressure. So this is a key, key um, uh, component of our thinking of designing new breath strategies uh, to combat um, alveolar dynamic stress or dynamic strain and uh, uh, stress concentrators. So the lung continually recruits at the same pressure. So in theory, if we extend the time at inspiration, we're going to recruit alveoli with each breath. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, on, during expiration, if we minimize alveolar collapse and reopening, we'll reduce dynamic strain. We won't give the alveolus time to collapse because it's not one to one, there's a time lag. Um, so it's spring a dash pop, so we have the spring here, it's gonna exhale, but then it's gonna inhale, we're gonna reinflate the lung very quickly. And notice, we do it so fast, the dash pot doesn't have time to move. So we can push a breath in and out quick enough so that alveoli stay open. So essentially, we're tricking the lung into oxygenating and ventilating uh, without causing undue dynamic strain on those alveoli. <clears throat> Biological evidence. Uh, here we have the, uh, uh, the ventilation screen. This is a rat lung um, with ARDS, and we have a very long expiratory duration, and you can see how these alveoli uh, are very unstable and collapse and expand with each breath. The exact same rat lung, we shorten the expiratory duration, and look at how we stabilized the alveoli. So it's showing that in the exact same lung, just the duration of expiration went from a very unstable lung causing these uh, um, dynamic strain-induced, uh, ventilator-induced lung injury to totally uh, keeping these alveoli stabilized, not with changes of pressure, but by changes of the duration of the applied breath. 
Uh, and I just want to throw a plug in here for uh, Josh Sadlin, who is a research, research scientist in our lab, is presenting a paper uh, uh, in a poster discussion tomorrow in room 206, uh, showing our most recent data uh, looking at the um, shortened expiratory durations and how they stabilize alveoli, actually looking into the mechanisms, whether pressure or duration. And uh, so if you're interested in more alveolar mechanics, uh, that's the place to go on Monday. So what are the mechanical vest strategies that actually alter duration? Uh, whether well, it's high frequency oscillation, there's reverse I to E, and there's airway pressure release ventilation. And uh, theoretically, all three of these will, will greatly modify the uh, inspiration uh, and the expiration times, depending on what we're looking at. Uh, our group has just chosen to use uh, airway pressure release ventilation uh, as a tool in order to very elegantly change the time of duration, uh, the change of duration, both inspiration and expiration. Um, so again, we're using APRV as a tool. Uh, the tool because it allows us to very precisely control uh, inspiration and expiration. Uh, so we have four basic uh, components, the time at high, T high, the time at low, T low, uh, the pressure at low, uh, P low, and the pressure at high, P high. And uh, as you can see, the duration of inspiration, uh, of the T high, and the uh, duration of expiration, T low. Uh, uh, we have a very long inspiratory duration and a very short expiratory duration. So that's the theory. We're just trying to use that spring and dash pot thing in order to trick the lung into doing what we want. Uh, so during inspiration, 90%, we'd like to uh, keep the inspiratory duration at 90% of the breath. And we feel, again, that that's going to nudge these alveoli open with each breath. So here's that example again. We push in the stress and we hold it, and alveoli recruit, 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 recruit over time. I want to show you, uh, uh, again, the biology to support this. These are two rat lungs with ARDS. You can see a few alveoli open, and atelectasis is here. Uh, same lung, of course, same area. Here we're going to just keep the inspiratory duration at 1%. And you can see with a 1% uh, inspiration, nothing happens. What happens if we had a 5% inspiration, which is typical of many APRV breaths? Uh, if you hold that for five seconds, look at all the alveoli you're going to recruit with each breath. So this dem demonstrates that we can recruit alveoli on a breath-to-breath -breath basis just by switching from a one-second inspiratory duration to a five-second. And again, that same lung that you saw, this is with one second, and this is with five seconds. So you can gain an awful lot of alveoli. You can open up a, lot of, a great deal of alveoli, especially if you think about doing this over 12 or 15 hours. Uh, you sort of nudge the alveoli open in a very gentle way. You've got you know, homogeneous ventilation uh, without causing a ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, <clears throat> during the, uh, the expiratory phase, um, we actually think we uh, stabilize alveoli by two mechanisms. Uh, because we have a very low, uh, short uh, expiratory time, the lung doesn't have time to empty all of its gas and or pressure. So we keep a positive expiratory pressure or PEEP in the lung just because we don't let it empty. We don't, let it, let, we don't leave it enough time to empty. And um, classically, what we found if we set uh, the duration the way we uh, do in the lab, that uh, it's about half of what the P-high is. So if the P-high was 20, uh, the PEEP would be around 10. And secondly, we set the duration shorter than the collapse time constant of the alveolus. So remember the spring and dash pot, the stress comes out, the gas comes out of the lung, uh, but the alveoli is going to have a distinct time lag before it starts to collapse. If we reinflate the lung before that alveoli moves, uh, we trick it into staying open and, uh, and maintaining oxygenation and ventilation. So again, here's the, the we let the, the expiration out very quickly. The uh, dash pot doesn't have time to move. Alveoli don't have time to de-recruit. And one more time, just showing a fast and a slow expiratory duration. Uh, same long, uh, just by changing the expiratory duration, we keep the alveoli open and stable. Uh, so now how do we set the expiratory duration? And, and Mickey uh, did allude to this, but I just want to go over this uh, a little more because this is really, really a clever component of this breath strategy um, because it really personalizes the, um, uh, the, the setting or the, or the stabilization uh, on each patient uh, dependent on the physiologic changes of that patient. So let me get back. So what we're going to do is uh, here's your pressure and your flow curve on your screen. We're actually going to use the flow, the, the flow curve on, uh, right on the ventilator screen in order to, uh, as a physiologic information from the lung to, for us to set our, uh, 
and set our ventilator. So here we have a normal and an ARDS lung. And what we're using from a physiologic perspective is the slope of the expiratory flow curve uh, to, uh, to assess our, uh, to, to uh, uh, generate our time at duration. And as you know, the slope of the curve or the change in the slope of the curve, that is the compliance of the lung. Uh, so in the normal lung, in the normal lung, we see the uh, slope is around 45 degrees. Uh, and then in the ARDS lung, because of surfactant deactivation, um, and, uh, and edema, that slope increases, okay, because the lung gets very stiff. It's trying to collapse. As soon as you re release pressure, the uh, lung's trying to collapse. And what uh, actually Dr. Habashi found, and uh, clinically, and he's used uh, incredible uh, for uh, about 20 years now, we've been testing what he has, uh, what he uses clinically, and we found very, very uh, exciting basic science results. And so what he's done in order to identify uh, where to set your T-low is he takes the peak expiratory flow, which in this case is minus 60, minus 60 liters, and the end expiratory flow, and he's looking for a ratio, the, P, the EEF to PF is 75%. So divide 60 into 45 and you get your 75%. Once you have that ratio, that will give you the time, in this case a half a second, the expiratory duration necessary to stabilize the alveoli. And how do you know that? The lung is telling that to you. Due to the slope of that expiratory flow curve, that's a change in lung compliance. The lung is saying, hey guy, I need a half second to keep me open. And uh, so that's what this is doing. The, you, you, the lung is directing the physician on what to set the duration in order to keep that stable. Notice in the, uh, in the ARDS lung, we use the same ratio. So how can you use the same ratio and, uh, and actually protect the lung? Because the slope has changed, the compliance has changed. Uh, now it tells the uh, physician that I actually need only a 0.45 seconds. You're gonna have to shorten that duration or I'm gonna collapse. So the lung is actually telling the physician, using this strategy, exactly where to set uh, expiratory duration in order to keep those alveoli open and stable. And uh, clinically, all you really have to do is take your peak expiratory flow times, times it by 0.75, and that will give you the approximate uh, point where you're going to stop exhalation, in this case at, at uh, 45 liters. Uh, so what we really have here, and I think every, uh, people have been looking for this for a long time, is a closed loop physiologic feedback system. Uh, we have our input. What do we want out of, out of our ventilation strategy? Well, we want the lung stable. S what's the controller? So how are we going to control this lung stability? Well, we're going to look at that EEF-PF ratio. That's going to be what's going to control it. And what's going to actually affect it? What's going to cause the stability? That's going to be your expiratory duration. If your expiratory duration is short enough, uh, faster than the collapse time counts of the alveoli, they won't collapse. And of course, our output, we want the lung to actually be stable. So. Uh, in order to do this, because we, we don't know if we set the controller once, if that's going to be the right place to set, we need a sensor. And the sensor is the slope of the expiratory flow curve. That is lung physiology. Uh, that is why driving pressure in the recent publications has, demonstrated, has correlated very well with mortality because driving pressure has the term compliance uh, in the equation. It's the lung telling you whether it's getting sicker or better. And uh, then the sensor is going to adjust the controller, the controller the effector, and the effector the output. So we have a closed loop physiologic feedback system in which we can, we can actually adjust expiratory uh, duration on a breath to breath basis if we like, without any special maneuvers in order to keep that patient's uh, lung open and stable. Uh, so we consider, uh, if you look at APRV, I know there's a lot of uh, ways to describe mechanical breasts, and uh, we describe breasts, and we look at, at, at mechanical ventilation a lot uh, differently. Uh, so we like to look at sort of the, the overview. What is this breath actually doing? And what we really come up with is APRV is a personalized, because it's personalized to the compliance changes of the patient's lung. It's adaptive. As the patient's lung gets sicker or better, that duration is going to change. And uh, so, you know, if we said have a 0.5 uh, second duration in the normal lung, the patient gets sicker, we go down to 0 0.45, 0 0.4. As the patient starts getting healthier, it's going to start coming back closer to the 0.5. Flow directed because we're measuring expiratory flow and duration dependent. We're decreasing the duration to the point uh, where we trick the alveolus into staying open. So do we have data to support our hypothesis? And uh, Mickey's already shown you some of the data. And, uh, but I wanted to show you just one of our studies. Uh, again, this is by Dr. Shreyas Roy. And uh, using our 48-hour uh, uh, model of uh, peritoneal sepsis and uh, gut ischemia perfusion. So it's a very clinically applicable model. 
um, that, uh, that really simulates uh, almost everything that you see in, uh, in secondary ARDS. And uh, Dr. Roy used four groups. He used APRV, and again, he used his, uh, he used a 75% of the PEF, uh, 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 EF ratio, and a 90% um, time at inspiration. Uh, we compared that to a sham group in which they were not injured. They did not get the, the uh, peritoneal sepsis or the, or the gut ischemia perfusion, and we just ventilated them with a tidal volume of 10 and a PEEP of 5. And we had the ARDSnet uh, using the high PEEP scale, low tidal volume, and changing a PEEP and FiO2 uh, on the uh, sliding scale. And we applied this after the animals became uh, uh, be became injured beca when, when they desaturated. The APRVs, because the way that it's done uh, in Maryland shock trauma, uh, we put them on APRV immediately uh, when they were, the pigs were intubated. Because uh, again, as, as Penny's going to talk about uh, in, the, in uh, very quickly, uh, or in the next lecture, is that uh, the, one of the key things is to preventing lung injury, or, or is to prevent it, is to actually start your protective ventilation strategy as soon as the patient's intubated. So that's what we did. And uh, we used Brock to spectrum antibiotics, early goal-directed uh, therapy of vasopressors and fluids, and all animals were continually monitored uh, according to ICU standards. Although we did not control tidal volume in the uh, APRV group, it was, we did measure it, it was 12 cc's per kilo, and of course, by definition, in the low tidal, tidal volume, it was six. So our results. Um, all pigs develop uh, all of the really the ramifications and of, uh, of uh, severe septic shock, including uh, leukopenia, hemodynamic compromise. Uh, we had to use multiple pressors and fluids in order to keep these animals alive. Positive uh, cultures for multiple bugs. Uh, they also develop complications of shock, abdominal compartment syndrome. We often, often had to do decompressive laparotomies. Uh, gastric stress ulcers, again, very indica in indica indicative of uh, untreated septic shock. Uh, coagulopathy and uh, other organ failure, including kidney failure. Uh, so this is what we found. Uh, this is, again, uh, the uh, uh, x-axis uh, time and hours, y-axis is the PF ratio, uh, APRV in the solid line, uh, low tidal volume in the large dots, and the small dots are the sham. Uh, so right off the bat, what we saw is that in the uh, APR, or in the low tidal volume group, they developed uh, acute lung injury, PF ratio less than 300 at about 21 hours. They developed ARDS, PF ratio less than 200 in 36 hours. And at 48 hours, the uh, APRV group had a similar PF ratio as the controls. Um, to say this surprised the heck out of me is an understatement. Uh, uh, Dr. Abashi and Penny thought this was going to be the results, but I have, I've worked at this job and for 40 years, and I've never seen anything quite like this. Uh, the animals were on room air uh, at this particular time also. Uh, so these were what the lungs looked like. Um, these are the, uh, the APRV lung. Uh, both the, the gross lungs here, uh, we maintain a standard vo lung volume history. These are both inflated to 25 centimeters of water pressure. <clears throat> so this is 25 centimeters of water, and this is also. You can see the, the marked difference. Uh, here's the cut surface. You can see no edema in the airway, no edema in the inner lobular space. Essentially, it looks like a nice, normal, healthy piece of tissue. Uh, contrast this to, uh, again, at a pressure, airway pressure of 25 centimeters of water, uh, the great deal of collapse in atelectasis, very heterogeneous kind of uh, looking tissue. And if we look at the cut surface, look at the edema uh, in the interlobular space. This is all a gel-like edema, and there's also edema in the airway. And uh, although I'm a lab rat, so this may not impress me as much as uh, will, I think will you guys, uh, this animal here uh, was 60 liters positive. So this animal started out this big and it ended up this big, and yet we pulled pristine lungs out of this animal because we protected them from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, as long as you keep those lungs open and stable, uh, you don't have to really worry about them. Uh, you can worry about the rest of your patient. So again, I literally get goose pimples every time I show this because it was such a incredible, really incredible finding. And uh, I surely did not hypothesize it would be this protective going into it. Uh, but we have three, uh, two subsequent publications after this, and we're seeing the same thing over and over. So uh, it, it does appear to be a real finding. So our hypothesis that uh, properly adjusted mechanical ventilation uh, can block all components of the tetrad has been supported. Uh, we found uh, that we actually re uh, reduce uh, capillary permeability um, 
by protecting epithelic adherent molecules, the molecules that actually uh, keep the capillaries together. Uh, we've shown that we uh, distinctly reduce edema. You can see the edema in the uh, non-treated lung and, and lack of it there. Uh, we've shown that we uh, protect pulmonary surfactant uh, but we've, we've shown a, uh, a higher concentration of surfactant proteins. And of course, we have uh, shown that we can stabilize alveoli and prevent ventilator-induced lung injury. And this work was actually on the, uh, the cover of the sh journal Shock. So our conclusion is that APRV can indeed block all four components of the pathologic tetrad of ARDS. Uh, summarized, uh, mechanism of villi in the microenvironment, uh, stress concentrators, a dynamic alveolar strain and overdistension, with overdistension really being secondary to stress concentration and alveolar strain. We block those two and, and overdistension disappears. Dynamic alveolar physiology, viscoelastic behavior. Think of the spring and dash pot when you're ventilating your patient. There's a time lag from when you push the tidal volume in and the alveoli start to move or recruit, a time lag when you let the air out, the gas out of the lungs before the alveoli uh, volume starts to change or they start to de-recruit. And the components of the mechanical breath that may be novel and a very exciting uh, uh, different strategy uh, would be to change the, the uh, to extend the to, to extend the inspiratory duration and shorten the expiratory duration. So bottom line, uh, does a homogeneous lung uh, prevent uh, ARDS? And at least in our lab, we found if you keep the lung homogeneous, our patients are very happy. If they go heterogeneous, well, then we have some problems. <laughs> And uh, again, this is a team. This is a, an incredible team effort. We have uh, just a great bunch of people working for us. Uh, and as you can see from all the work that we've been doing, it's, it's uh, more than a one-man job. So this is, uh, it, it, we're successful because our team's so successful. Uh, I also want to, we do have an APRV workshop. If you're interested in this, we give a very high intensity uh, two-day training. Uh, both the didactic lectures, much of what you'll hear today, uh, plus hands-on uh, uh, ventilation uh, treatment with, in, in an uh, animal model, a large animal pig model of ARDS. Uh, we don't have the date set, but we will have it in the spring since we're in central New York. We don't want to suffer anybody coming to New York in the, in the New York winter. Uh, so it'll be in April or May, probably we'll have our next one. And uh, Josh Sadlin is, uh, you can see his number and his email down uh, in the lower left, and uh, Josh is the one who's going to be presenting uh, his paper on uh, uh, the mechanism of um, uh, shortened expiratory times on preventing alveolar collapse. But you can contact him, and uh, we will have it up on our website uh, once we actually pick a date. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and now uh, turn the podium over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Penny Andrews. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, Penny is a, uh, uh, an amazing clinician. Uh, I think what, one of the, the, the great things about our team is uh, I'm a lab rat. I've never treated a patient. I, if I touch a ventilator on a patient, then I go to jail. So, um, so what I do is I study, I study alveoli, I study alveolar mechanics. Uh, Nader and I, uh, we met quite a few years ago, luckily, and uh, he told me about this APRV thing. I said, damn, that makes sense. I go, let's go try that out in the lab. So uh, now you're gonna, what you're going to get is the clinical compliment. So uh, uh, I know Nader has over a million hours of ventilating um, uh, patients with APRV. I would guess Penny has well over half of that. So uh, there's probably, there's, there's two people in the, in the world that know how to, uh, to, to run, to, to uh, ventilate patients with APRV, at least with the strategy that, uh, that Penny and, and Nader came up with and, and the strategy that all of our basic science supports. And that would be uh, Dr. Bashi and, and Penny. And uh, so you're going to get uh, a world authority on ventilating patients with APRV. Thank you very much.